بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last uh, episode we spoke in detail about the wedding of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi and Khadija and we spoke about you know how they met their business partnership we spoke about the wedding itself and we ended our last session um, by highlighting that contrary to the popularized narrative that says that Khadija was 40 years old when the Prophet married her uh, when we look at the historical the more accurate historical accounts uh, we see that they were actually of similar age now <clears throat> as you can imagine the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija was a blissful one by any measure uh, these are two people who have shared values they are you know uh, they're, they're spiritual spiritually elevated individuals uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not marry her because of a financial motivation. Khadija had turned down numerous suitors. So this was a marriage where both, both parties genuinely loved and respected each other. Now, when Khadija married the Prophet, there was a lot of chatter among some of the, the women of Mecca and you know they would kind of ridicule Khadija for marrying down in terms of wealth and there's no doubt that Khadija may have married down in terms of wealth because she was far more uh, wealthy than the Prophet but she saw something in the Prophet that was much more valuable than any wealth she saw him as a man of great integrity a man of morality a virtuous individual and someone who she felt that she could grow with as an individual now after their marriage uh, we see that children arrive very quickly they have uh, children almost immediately and <clears throat> this further cements the already existing strong bond between the Prophet and Khadija now, <clears throat> the, f the first son that they have, was na his name was Qasim. And we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, his kunya is uh, Abu Al-Qasim. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's in this, you know, blissful marriage. They start to have children <clears throat> and having a son is a big deal in arabia and the prophet ﷺ and khadija they lose their first son uh, before his second birthday so he's you know a, a an infant and this left a deep void in the prophet ﷺ. and the prophet's lack of a male heir was the reason why he would remain as an abtar in the eyes of Meccan society. If you look at Surah Al-Kawthar, which is going to be revealed, you know, uh, many years down the road, uh, Al-As uh, Al ibn, uh, ibn Wa'il, among others, they would poke fun at the Prophet and say to him that you're an abtar. You know, an abtar literally means an animal whose tail has been severed, meaning that you have no posterity. You have no one who is going to continue who's going to carry your name so essentially you are you know your name is going to die with your own death you have no one who's going to carry on your name so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi uh, was, was deeply grieved for the loss of uh, of al-qasim now <clears throat> one of the things that is mentioned uh, in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is that Khadija actually had a servant by the name of Zayd. 
he was about 15 years old when uh, she married the prophet and she actually gives she gifts the prophet this uh, young boy who was a slave and this was uh, one of the wedding gifts that Khadija gave to the prophet and it was very common in this cultural context for for servants to be given uh, as gifts now Zayd ibn Haritha is an interesting individual in the history uh, in Islamic history uh, he's so he, he's the servant of Khadija she gifts him to the prophet and Zayd was actually from the northern tribe of Kelb uh, which is situated between Syria and Iraq and the story of how he ended up in the custody of Khadija is that there was a dispute there was a fight between his mother's tribe and his father's tribe and he was actually abducted by his maternal uncles and they and they did this to to spite uh, his father and the, and his father's tribe so he was abducted and he was sold into slavery and then you know he's he eventually ends up uh, as a slave as a servant of Khadija so so you have the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi and Khadija and they're essentially uh, raising this young teenage boy and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi he he treats him as his own son you know so even though the prophet loses uh, qasim He's 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 able to see Zaid as a replacement in the sense that he feels uh, uh, Zaid to be uh, his own son. So that having Zaid really helped the Prophet fill that uh, emotional void of not having a son of his own. Now, shortly after the marriage of the Prophet and Khadija, Zaid encounters some visiting pilgrims who are coming from the north and they're from Banu Kalb they're from his tribe and when he sees them he passes on he passes along a message to his family saying that I'm in I'm in Mecca I'm safe I'm happy I'm I'm very comfortable with my new uh, family now upon hearing this uh, his father Haritha, because you know his name is Zaid ibn Haritha. His father Haritha hears that his son is alive, and he's he's living with a uh, a Qurayshi family in uh, in Mecca. So he decides to make the journey to Mecca to pay for Zaid's freedom. Now, when Haritha arrives. In Mecca, he meets uh, he meets Zaid's you know foster parents, or he meets his essentially his masters. Now the Prophet sallallahu being the merciful individual that he was, he empathized with uh, the boy's father, and he told Zaid that you know listen, you're you're free to return to your family. You're not obligated to stay in our household. So when the Prophet ﷺ gives Zaid the opportunity and he gives him the green light to go back, that you're you have my blessing and I, I release you. Zaid replied, and this is you know in the presence of uh, of his own father, he says, "I would not choose any man in preference to you. You are to me as my father and mother." Imagine how much love and how much he respected the Prophet. And this is this is Rasulullah before the Ba'tha behind closed doors. You know, there are some individuals who act saintly in public spaces, but behind closed doors, you know, if you really want to know the worth of an individual, ask, you know, their families about them. You know, how are they with their families? How are they? How do they conduct themselves? When they're outside of the public eye. So here you see Zayd ibn Haritha saying that, Ya Rasul, O Muhammad, you, you know, yes, this is my biological father and I respect him and I love him, but you 
are you're you're my father and my mother. I get everything that I need from you. I have seen, and then he says to his father that I, that I have seen from this man, this man Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wa I have seen from this man such things that I could never choose another above him. Now, after after hearing these words. The Prophet ﷺ, he sees that Zayd is not willing to leave. He's not willing to go back to his own family. He invites Zayd's father. He invites Haritha and his uncle to join him at the Kaaba, where the Prophet ﷺ wants to make a public statement. And you know this is mentioned by Ibn Sa'd in his Tabaqat. He says that the Prophet ﷺ goes to the Kaaba with Zayd ibn Haritha. Haritha is there, his uncles, and he says, All of you who are present, bear witness that Zayd is my son. You know, if there was any fear in the heart of the father that, you know, is this is this just a master-slave relationship? The Prophet ﷺ quells all of these fears and these anxieties, and he publicly announces, you know, to express and to make it known that this Zayd is very beloved to me. He's not just a servant. I am considering him my son. Bear witness that Zayd is my son. I am his heir and he is mine. And the Prophet ﷺ, essentially what he does is that uh, he he adopts him. He, he formally adopts him. And therefore the, the relationship changes from a master-slave relationship to... Uh, an adopted son, adopted father relationship. And this is why when you look at the, the books of the seerah, you see that Zayd ibn Haritha uh, became known as Zayd ibn Muhammad. So even though he wasn't the biological son of the Prophet, the Prophet treated him like his own son to such an extent that people would call him Zayd, the son of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So he declines the offer to travel north and return to his parents and his tribe. And he remains in Mecca with his adoptive father, sallallahu alayhi wa And the narrations say that Haritha returned home without any bitterness in his heart. When he, when he met the Prophet and he saw that his son was in good hands, and he was, I mean, he was... Uh, he was an adult at this point, uh, who had you know the uh, the autonomy, the ability to make his own choices. Haritha leaves without any ill feelings towards his son or towards the Prophet So this again is an example of you know the magnanimous character of the Prophet. That those even those who met him before the commencement of the prophetic mission, they they gravitated toward him. He had a very magnetic uh, personality. I mean, just imagine, Zayd ibn Haritha chooses to live with the Prophet over his own mother and father. Now, so and, and this really speaks to the, the loving atmosphere that existed in the home of the Prophet and Khadija. And and this is why we say that this this was a very blessed marriage. You know, the house of Rasulullah and Khadija was really a safe haven for the marginalized. You know, it was it was a beacon of light to the uh, to those who felt disenfranchised. Now, what's interesting, as as we mentioned in our previous episode, Khadija Khadija was astronomically wealthy. I mean, she would be the equivalent of a multi-billionaire by today's standards. But despite her great wealth, you see that her and the Prophet, they, they chose, they made a conscious decision to live a minimalistic life, to live a simple life. They they shared each other's values. You know, they, they were in, they both did not they were both not obsessed with money. They were not money centered people. And <clears throat> they actually spent a lot of their money on the poor and the destitute. 
And the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija were very disturbed by the the societal trends at the time. They were disturbed by the by the inequities of Meccan society, the the, the huge disparity between the rich and the poor. Uh, you know, it's important to remember that the majority of Meccans were were poor. You know, just a, a couple of generations earlier. I mean, wealth, the 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 influx of money and wealth was a result of the the trading expeditions that were established by Rasulullah's great grandfather. So, you know, prior to that, most Meccans, most of Arabia was really uh, very economically weak. So, you know, about so a couple of generations, two, three generations after the establishment of these trading routes, this is when you see this huge influx of money, of wealth, and, and you start to see the greed and the disparity. You know, what was once an, ega an egalitarian Bedouin culture has now transformed into a highly stratified society where the gap between the rich and poor is ever widening. So, so keeping that in mind, you know, Khadija had the money. She had the resources to live an ostentatious life. They could have lived the most luxurious life. The Prophet you know, if he was motivated by money, if he married Khadija because of her wealth, or if that, if that was even a consideration, you we would have seen signs of him indulging in uh, in the wealth. But on the contrary, you see that they lived their joint life according to the principles of zuhd. You know, they actually wore homespun linen. You know, they would actually. Uh, spin their own uh, clothes. They would make their own clothes. So, so even though Khadija has the wealth to buy the the fanciest and the most lavish silk that was worn by the elites of of Meccan society, her and the Prophet ﷺ they wore homespun linen. If the Prophet or Khadija, if they had a hole in their garments, they wouldn't purchase new clothes. They would simply mend their clothes. They would patch up the holes. And they used their disposable income to feed the poor, to take care of the widows and the orphans. You know, brothers and sisters, it's not a mistake that this becomes the household of revelation. Right? You know, there are many people who are faithful, but the moment they're tested with wealth, you see that they enter into this state of heedlessness. They no longer are, con are concerned with, you know, the the conditions of society. But you see that Khadija and the Prophet, they have the wealth, they have the ability to live a lavish life, but they make a conscious decision to live a simplistic life and use their wealth to uplift the, the less fortunate. Now... When the Prophet ﷺ, so the Prophet marries Khadija at the age of 25, about five years later, when the Prophet is 30, this is where you see in the history of Islam the birth of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So there is a 30 year difference uh, between the Prophet and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, as we mentioned in our previous episodes, when, the, when, when Abu Talib used to take the Prophet with him on his trading uh, expeditions to Syria, he encountered, he came in contact with a number of monks and religious figures who were experts in scripture and they prophesied, they told Abu Talib that this young boy, this nephew of yours is unique is special he's the chosen he's the chosen one he is the promised one protect him guard him now it seems from the narrations of ahlul bayt that abu talib was also informed by a monk sometime earlier 
that a son would be born to him. So not only is he the uncle of a messenger of God, but he will be the father of one of the greatest awliya of Allah, the vicegerent of God. And you see, when you look at the traditions that we mentioned uh, uh, when we spoke about, uh, in the episode where we spoke about the birth of the Prophet, and you know, Amin is seeing visions of the conquest of of Syria and other regions. Uh, Fatima bint Asad, she relays these visions to Abu Talib. And, you know, Abu Talib says that, why, why does this surprise you? you you're going to give birth to the successor of this, this boy. So Abu Talib definitely had the knowledge, you know, through inspiration. or However, he had this knowledge that, that from his loins... Allah's wali would be born and the successor of the final messenger of God uh, would come. So both Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad, they were hopeful that this child would be the fulfillment of that prophecy. So they devoted themselves to prayer. They performed daily pilgrimages to the Kaaba because they knew that you know if you're going to if you're going to give birth to a chosen one of God, you have to prepare your soul. You have to prepare yourself to receive this great ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, on Friday, on the 13th of Rajab, 30 years after the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad, they were circuiting they were performing, performing tawaf around the Kaaba Fatima bint Asad was full term she was in her final trimester they were performing uh rounds circuits around the Kaaba as they did every day hoping and praying that Allah would bless them that this child who's in the womb of Fatima bint Asad is the promised child who is going to be the vicegerent of God now, as they're performing tawaf, Fatima bint Asad feels the pangs of labor. And as she's performing tawaf with Abu Talib, holding her, she makes a dua. She feels that she's going into labor, and she turns in dua. And this supplication is, is mentioned by Alam al-Majlisi in Bihar al-Anwar. Volume 35, page 36. What does she say? She turns. So imagine, you know, this is a woman who's full term. She's feeling the, the pains of labor. And her instinct is to turn to God. She's standing before the house of God. And she begins to pray. She says, Rabbi inni mu'minatun bik. O my Lord, I firmly believe in you. I believe in the scriptures that you have revealed. I believe in, I believe in the messengers that you have sent. And I affirm the teachings of my forefather Ibrahim. And I affirm that he is the one who built this ancient house. فَأَسْأَلُكَ بِحَقِّهَا ذَا الْبَيْتِ وَمَنْ بَنَا Oh Allah, I ask you, for the sake of the one who built this house, وَبِهَاذَا الْمَوْلُودِ الَّذِي فِي أَحْشَائِ And I ask you, for the sake of the child who is in my womb, الَّذِي يُكَلِّمُنِي وَيُؤْنِسُنِي بِحَدِيثِ This child who speaks to me, who comforts me, وَأَنَا مُوقِنَةٌ أَنَّهُ إِحْدَى آيَاتِكَ دَلَائِلَكَ أَنَّهُ إِحْدَى آيَاتِكَ وَدَلَائِلَكَ And I know that this child is one of your signs. I ask you for, for the sake of Ibrahim who built this house and for the sake of this blessed child, and I know this child is blessed, and I know he is one of your signs, I ask you to make my labor easy for me. Now, incidentally, 
the Prophet ﷺ was also there in Masjid al-Haram. He was very in close proximity to Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad. So the Prophet ﷺ, he takes the hand, he hears the dua of Fatima bint Asad, he takes the hand of Abu Talib, who's holding the hand of Fatima bint Asad, and he leads them towards the Kaaba. Now this is an indication that the Prophet knows. He knows what is about to unfold. He knows about the greatness of the child who is in the womb of Fatima ibn Asad. It seems, I mean, it's very evident that the Prophet is essentially escorting her to the designated birthplace of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He takes Abu Talib by the hand and he leads them to the Kaaba. Now, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, was sitting with a number of other men from Quraysh, and they were sitting in close in, in the vicinity of the Kaaba, and they witnessed this firsthand. We have a narration from Yazid ibn Qa'na, who says that I was sitting with, with uh, Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, and Abu Talib and Fatima ibn Asad, they were performing tawaf, Rasulullah was there. He was, he was 30 years old at the time. He leads them to the Kaaba and suddenly we witness the wall of the Kaaba, which was opposite of its door, it split open. And she enters into the Kaaba by herself. Abu Talib doesn't enter. Rasulullah doesn't enter. As soon as she enters, the wall closes behind her immediately. Now you can imagine how flabbergasted the eyewitnesses were. So when they saw that the, Ka the walls of the Kaaba had closed behind her, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the other men, they frantically ran to the point where she entered and they saw that it was closed. And then they run to the door of the Kaaba, and they also found that it was closed. They were not able to open it. You know, typically they were able to access the inside, the confines of the Kaaba through the door. But the door was closed. They were not able to open it. Tens of people came and tried to unlock the door to open it, but it wasn't opening. And here the Prophet ﷺ assured them that they had just witnessed a mu'jizah. This is a miracle. That what is happening is being managed by God. The narrations also mention that Fatima bint Asad remained inside of the Kaaba for three days. This is what we find in our narrations. For three days, no one came out and no one went in for three days. Now you can imagine how worried people were. You know, this is a pregnant woman needs assistance. She might she needs a wet nurse. You know, who's taking care of the food, the water? Allahu Akbar. But for three days she was in there. On the third day, when she exited, she presented her newborn to Abu Talib. The name was chosen. He was named Ali. And of course we have narrations that, that mention that she was inspired to name him Ali. Some reports mention that the first face that he saw, that the first face that Ali ibn Abi Talib saw when he was born, his eyes were closed. The first face that he saw was the face of the blessed messenger. The first face that he saw was the face of his beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he was born with his, with his umbilical cord severed, according to the ahadith. He was born without any blood being spilt. When they saw, when they saw inside of the Kaaba, there was no blood whatsoever. He was born fully circumcised, which is the way in which many of the prophets and the awliya are born, the ones who are chosen by Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said on this occasion, on the, the, on the day that, the 13th of Rajah, the day that Ali ibn Abi Talib was born, Rasulullah says, it's reported that he said, on this night, 
A child has been born to us through whom God will open many doors of blessings and mercy. And indeed, you know, the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib is a testament to the rahmah and the blessings of Allah. I mean, this is a man who Islam and the Muslims, they owe a debt of gratitude to him. This is the man who protected the Messenger of God, who preserved the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. So any good deed that anyone does, any good deed that any Muslim does, Ali ibn Abi Talib has a share in it. Because he was the, the protector of the messenger. He was the protector of the messenger and the message. So this is with respect to the, the birth of Ali ibn Abi Talib, which was you know, a, a very seminal event in the, uh, the life of the Prophet before the Ba'tha. Now, five years before the Ba'tha, another important event takes place. <clears throat> now, the, the, the popular narrative in the Sunni tradition is that Fatima al Zahra السلام, was born five years before the Ba'tha. However, in the Shi'i tradition, we reject uh, these uh, this view and we argue that she was born five years after the Ba'tha. And it's possible that the motivation to insist that she was born before the Ba'tha is to strip her birth of any of the miraculous uh, elements that we find uh, in the narrations where the Prophet you know, uh, takes from the fruits of Jannah. So in order to kind of uh, <clears throat> reject all of those miraculous elements surrounding her birth, some... Uh, assert and insist that no, Fatima al-Zahra was born before the Ba'tha of the Prophet and therefore all of this talk about uh, her her life germ, her life seed being from Jannah, these are all fabrications. In the Shi'i tradition we believe that she was born five years after the Ba'tha and inshallah uh, as, we, as we proceed in <clears throat> uh, our narrative of the prophetic biography uh, we'll get to that. So five years before the commencement of the prophetic mission, the Kaaba was damaged by a flood. Now the Kaaba has been damaged and it's been rebuilt over the years. I mean, even going back to the time of Ibrahim, the Kaaba was damaged during the flood of of Nuh. You know, just from the you know the passing of time, and Ibrahim raised the foundations of. The Kaaba. The Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ Ibrahim and Ismail, they, ra they raised the foundations of the Kaaba. The Kaaba was existed from the time of, of Adam. It was just rebuilt during the time of Ibrahim. And, you know, generation after generation, it went through periods of, uh, it was damaged and had to be rebuilt and restored. So five years before the Ba'tha, the Kaaba was damaged by a flood. Now the Quraysh, you know, being the official custodians and caretakers of the Kaaba, they decided to finance the rebuilding of the Kaaba. Now because the Kaaba was sacred, even in their eyes, even though they were mushrikeen, they still considered the Kaaba to be sacred. And therefore, they ensured that the money that was being used to rebuild the Kaaba was from lawful sources. So meaning this was not money that was accumulated from, you know, prostitution. It was not money that was accumulated through usury. It was not money that was stolen or usurped. This, it was purely halal money. And this, is, and this is why you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was... Uh, was a participant. You know, the Prophet was always very adamant about ensuring that the financing of any project is clean money. So you see, the Prophet ﷺ was very uh, particular about doing things with lawful money. So the Prophet would not even participate in the rebuilding of the Kaaba if it involved the usage of unlawful money. Now, 
rebuilding the Kaaba is a big deal. So the the tri the different clans within the Quraysh they participated in the uh, reconstruction efforts. Now, when the Kaaba was rebuilt, when they fixed the the stones and the bricks, it was time to place Hajar al Aswad in the corner. Now, you can imagine every clan wanted to have the honor of placing Hajar al Aswad in its position, and a fight breaks out. In fact, an all-out war almost broke out between the different clans. Um Salama's father, Um Salama, who in the future will be the, the wife of the Prophet, her father, Abu Umayyah, he proposed, you know, he tried to, to calm everyone down, and he proposed a resolution. He said that, listen, since all of us want, since every clan wants to have the honor of placing the black stone and inserting it in its position, and we know that we're not going to come to an agreement, the resolution that I propose is that let us allow the next person who enters Masjid al-Haram to be the, the arbiter. And they will choose the tribe that will place the black stone in its place. So they agree. They said, okay, we will leave the decision since all of us are partial. We'll wait for the next person to enter the sacred mosque and we will all submit to their, to their decision, to their judgment. So they agree. At that moment, the, the person who enters Masjid al-Haram was the Prophet himself. So they all were relieved. They said, you know, Asadiq al Amin, the, the trustworthy one, the uh, the truthful one has entered the sacred mosque, Radina, that we're, we, we're happy, we're pleased, we're content for Muhammad to be the judge. So you see that even in the pre Islamic era, everyone trusted the Prophet's judgment. They considered him to be impartial, they considered him to be honest, to be trustworthy, to be in. Uh, a problem solver. So they defer to his judgment. Now the Prophet Sallallahu he sees that you know emotions are running high. He doesn't say to them that you guys are silly, you're ignorant, why are you guys making such a big deal about placing the black stone? No. He doesn't demean them. He doesn't say anything condescending to them. He very calmly proposes. He says, bring a, a piece of fabric. A large piece of fabric. So they bring a piece of fabric. Rasulullah places the black stone in the uh, in the middle, and he asks every all the tribes, all of the different clans, to have a member of their clan lift the end of the fabric. So they do so. So now the Prophet Sallallahu comes to a very beautiful compromise. Now every single clan feels that they participated in the placement of Hajar al-Aswad. So they all lift this uh, this cloth. The Prophet takes it and he places this, uh, the black stone in its place. So here the Prophet ﷺ again showcases his wisdom, his diplomacy, his mercy. And the Prophet prevents an all-out war. You know, the Prophet's judgment here literally protects people's lives because the clans of Quraysh were literally on the verge of war with one another. Blood was about to be spilled. But the Prophet, using his wisdom and his judgment, he is able to diffuse those, uh, those tensions. And he comes to a compromise that pleases all of the parties involved. Now, four years before the Ba'tha, so as you see, we're, we're, we're approaching the, uh, the, uh, the Ba'tha of the Prophet. And inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak about uh, the incident of Ghar Hira. Now, in the fourth year before the Ba'tha, there was a severe drought in Mecca. 
Now, Abu Talib, being the chief of Quraysh, you know, he had a large family. He has, you know, Talib, Aqil, Ja'far, Ali. He has daughters. There's a lot of financial, he has a lot of financial responsibilities. And because the drought, uh, you know, was bad for the, the general economy, it put a lot of financial strain on Abu Talib to care for, for all of his children. So when the Prophet ﷺ saw that Abu Talib was going through some financial hardship, the Prophet ﷺ suggested to Abbas, his uncle, that they should help Abu Talib by taking some of his children and caring for them. So Abu Talib, he says, I want you to leave Aqil with me. Leave Aqil with me and take any of the others whom you can. So Hamza, he says, I'll take Ja'far. I'll essentially adopt Ja'far and I'll take care of him. I'll clothe him, I'll feed him, and I'll raise him in my household. Abbas took Talib. And the Prophet ﷺ, he takes the six-year-old Ali. And the Prophet, he says, I choose him whom God chose for me. So you see, brothers and sisters, there is this affinity between the Prophet ﷺ and Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this is not just a relationship that you know began and was strengthened, you know, with the descent of revelation. This is a brotherhood. This is a spiritual unity that existed long before the uh, the Bi'tha. and this is why you see that Imam. Amir al-Mu'mineen, and this is a statement from uh, Al-Hakim al-Naysaburi and uh, Al-Mustadrak al sahihain He records this statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib in volume 3, page 112. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he says, Sallaytu qabla nas bi sab'i sinin qabla ay, qabla ay ya'buduhu ahadun qabla ay ya'buduhu ahadun min hadhi al-umma. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib used to say that I worshipped God before anyone from this nation for seven years. So we know that Ali ibn Abi Talib, he worshipped the Prophet, he, he prayed with the Prophet before prayer was even legislated. He used to meditate with the Prophet, he used to pray with the Prophet even before the Bi'tha. He would also say that I used to hear voices and see light for seven years, when the Messenger of God was yet silent. So, the, and this second quotation is not in Al Mustadrak al Sahihain, it's only the first. So, the second is, of course, this is found in, in Shia narrations where Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says that seven years before the, the Bi'tha, I used to, I used to, uh, so before the Prophet publicizes his mission. For seven years, I used to hear voices. I used to see light, nur. For seven years, when the Prophet was silent, not having not having been given leave to warn and proselytize. So Amir al-Mu'mineen he sees these brilliant signs in the in the Prophet even before the commencement of the prophetic mission. And I'll conclude here with uh, a statement from Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al uh, It's found in Sermon 192, where, the pro where Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib gives us a sense of his close relationship with the Prophet. You know, what it was like growing up with the Prophet. Now, as, as we mentioned, the Prophet adopts Ali ibn Abi Talib at six years old. But even before the age of six, you know, the Prophet was essentially, he, he was essentially a son of Abu Talib. He was, you know, even though he was married to Khadija, he spent a lot of time with the family of Abu Talib. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, describing his close relationship to the Prophet, he says, وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ مَوْضِعِ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ بِالْقَرَابَةِ الْقَرِيبَةِ he says to the Muslims, especially after the death of the Prophet, after his right was usurped, 
He says, and you knew my position with the Messenger of God. So those who, you know, usurped the Khilafah from Amir al muminin it's these are not people who were ignorant of the stature and the unique position of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, and you knew my position with the Messenger of God through my close kinship and special standing. وَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ مَوْضِعِ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ بِالْقَرَابَةِ الْقَرِيبَةِ وَالْمَنْزِلَةِ الْخَصِيصَةِ وَضَعْنِي فِي حِجْرِ وَأَنَا وَلِيدٌ يَضُمُّنِ إِلَى صَدْرِ He, when I was only a child, he took charge of me. So even when Ali was in the home of Abu Talib, the Prophet was still nurturing him. He still had a very close bond to him. He used to press me to his chest. The Prophet ﷺ used to hug and he used to embrace Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was a very loving relationship. The Prophet was so kind, so compassionate. He used to give special attention to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And on occasions when the Prophet would, you know, when, when Ali ibn Abi Talib would s- spend the night at the house of Khadija and the Prophet or the Prophet was was sleeping uh, at the home of Abu Talib. In any case, Ali says, and he would lay me beside him in his bed. He would bring his body close to mine. I used to smell the fragrance of Rasulullah. وَكَانَ يَمْضَغُ الشَّيْءِ ثُمَّ يُلْقِمُنِيهِ Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says that when I was a young boy, when I was a child, the Prophet used to chew something and then feed me with it. So the Prophet used to soften the food and he used to put it in the mouth of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Prophet used to treat Ali ibn Abi Talib in the same way that a mother treats her child. Because the Prophet is nurturing Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's grooming him for the great role that he will play in the future. He used to chew something and then feed me with it. وَمَا وَجَدَ لِي كِذْبَةً فِي قَوْلِ وَلَا خَطْلَةً فِي فعل. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says that he found no lie in my speaking. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, if you want someone to bear witness to my infallibility, then ask the Prophet. He will tell you that even as a child, he never heard me utter a single lie, nor did he ever see any misconduct in my action. So this gives you an idea of what it was like to be in the household of the Prophet. This is Ali's reflection on his upbringing under the towering personality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak about that moment, that night in the cave of Hara that changed the life of the Prophet and changed the course of human history forever. I look forward to having you join me in our next episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Any questions or comments? So how widely was it accepted by the Arabs in pre-Islamic times that Prophet Abraham built the Kaaba? And especially did the local Christians and Jews accept that fact? Now, the, the Arabs, the Quraysh, all of them, even the Mushrikeen among them, they recognized that that he built he built the Kaaba, that he rebuilt the Kaaba. This is not something that was uh, disputed. Now, what did the Christians believe? I don't know. I'm not sure what the the Christian perspective on that would be. What did the Jews believe? Now, you have to remember that. Uh, the Jews did not believe in uh, in the infallibility of the prophets in the way that we believe in the infallibility of the prophets. Uh, as you know, 
from the Jewish perspective, Ismail is an illegitimate child. He is he is the son of a slave girl. So he's not, and this is why they don't believe that prophets would come from his uh, descendants. So setting aside, so the Christian perspective, it's not really clear what they believe about the Kaaba. Uh, was it actually built by Ibrahim? I'm inclined to say that yes, you know, if you look at uh, someone like Waraka, the uh, the cousin of Khadija, there's nothing in his statements that would indicate that this is a fabrication. Uh, from from the Jewish perspective, it's possible, but again, they don't they don't give a lot of weight. They don't see the the Kaaba as having any special sanctity, uh, and they they consider uh, Ismail uh, to be uh, to be illegitimate. So, uh, but generally, the general attitude of the Arabs in the pre-Islamic era, the, the Mushrikeen among them, is that they they see the Kaaba as being sacred, and they recognize Ibrahim as being the one who raised its foundations. So, so Ibrahim is really a figure that unites the Mushrikeen, the Christians, and the Jews. So he he's seen as you know, a very sanctified patriarch in the uh, in the collective imagination of the, the the polytheists, the Christians, and the Jews. Thank you. And do we know if the Prophet and Khadija sent their son to live with the Bedouins? Uh, no, that uh, we don't have any uh, any evidence of that happening. So. As we mentioned, Al Qasim, he dies before his second uh, birthday. So, I did not find anything in the Sira that mentions that uh, that they did that. Why did that tradition stop? I I don't know. I'm not sure. It could have been. It's it's possible. Uh, it's possible that you know this was a very common practice. Uh, you know, you know, before the birth of the prophet, it's not clear if this is something that that changed. But again, I I didn't find anything in the sira to suggest that that Khadija and the prophet made arrangements for their their son to be sent to live with the Bedouins. And who were the other children of the prophet from Bibi Khadija other than Qasim and Bibi Fatima? So again, when it comes to the the children of the prophet, this is this is something that is debated. There are some, and here I'm I'm speaking about even Shi'i scholars. There are Shi'i scholars who believe that that the prophet had you know two sons who died in infancy, and the only surviving child. Of the Prophet was Fatima to Zahra. That's one opinion. And there are many scholars who do believe that, and they consider they believe that the other children who are attributed to the Prophet and Khadija, they were actually the the children of the uh, of Khadija's sister, and they were basically raised by Khadija and the Prophet. So that that's how they understand. Uh, their relationship to them. However, again, b based on my my own research, it's uh, it's highly likely that the Prophet sallallahu had multiple daughters. Uh, you know, you know, Um Kulthum uh, was one of them. Ruqayya would be another of them. So there's there's we don't have any evidence. That that gives us certainty, or even ultimate non, you know, satisfaction that the prophet that Fatima to Zara was the only surviving uh, child of the prophet. So I'll I'll have to give you the list. I, I forget the exact name. So you you have Al Qasim, you have Abdullah or Tahir. Uh, so these two died in their infancy. You have uh, of course Fatima. You have Um Kulthum. You have Ruqayya. So the Prophet, according, if you include 
even the ones who passed away, it seems that they had six children in all. And the reason why some scholars also mention that one of the evidences that Fatima to Zahra was not the only daughter of the Prophet is the Quran. Ya ayyuha nabi qul li azwajika wa banatik. O oh, Messenger, say to your wives and your daughters, Banatic is plural. So again, we we don't we're not gonna say one or the other with 100 percent certainty, but it, there seems to be more evidence to suggest that the Prophet had multiple daughters. And that again, that in no way diminishes the stature of Fatima to Zahra. So we don't need to say that. For Fatima to Zahra to occupy this unique position, she has to be the, the Prophet's only daughter. No. In the same way that Ali ibn Abi Talib had siblings, and that doesn't diminish the status of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima to Zahra could also have sisters, and it doesn't, it doesn't diminish her status. So, so from, from what I recall, the Prophet had about six, uh, six children. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. And, and inshallah, next week is when is when Islam begins, <laughs> when revelation begins. So we look forward to uh, to discussing some of the, the intricate details and we'll be doing, we'll compare and contrast the the popularized Sunni narrative of the occasion of Ghar Hira and, and what do, what do the, the narrations of Ahlul Bayt Say so that should be an interesting uh, discussion.